Good morning. Good morning, Rabotai. Good Chodesh. Good Chodesh, Rabotai. Chodesh Tov. Rabotai, welcome to Breakfast in the Class. Breakfast in the Class today is sponsored um, by the Kahal, dedicated in honor of Sammy and uh, Naomi Calvo. It's been a pleasure having them in Manhattan and part of our community. We wish them all the best and hope to see them soon. You know, all the people who are listening live, they realize that you get such special treatment if you're part of the community. Everyone's going to move here and then leave so that we give them the same thing. Okay, fine. The second, the second uh, beautiful sponsorship, Rabutai, and this is where you see the love and the connection between a community and its people and the people in its community. The second sponsorship is sponsored by Sammy Calvo, dedicated by uh, him and his, uh, and his wife Naomi in honor of the rabbis, Haron, the entire Safra congregation for being a place of achdut during his time in Manhattan. Look, we're dedicating it to him. He's dedicating it to us. Ani le dodi ve dodi li. Ani le semi ve semi li. Breakfast in the class also dedicated for the speedy and complete of Shalema of Yitzchak ben Miriam, sponsored anonymously. As well, dedicated as well for the speedy and complete of Shalema of Maimon Edmond ben Rachel, sponsored by Michael Shemtov, and the week of Kobru is sponsored uh, by David Yash in honor of you and your substantial capacity to good today and every day. Sammy and Naomi, we wish you a beautiful new yeshuv, a, a nice and easy move. Uh, I'm only willing to let you go on one condition. Shuvi, shuvi ashulamit, shuvi, shuvi v'nech zevach. You should return. We should get a chance to see you uh, very often. Uh, you can take a good, a good uh, lesson. We just had uh, Murad who came back for Shabbat. You can take a good lesson from him uh, to, uh, to join us and revisit us many, many times. You will always be a part of our community and our hearts. Amen. The Pasuk begins by telling you, Kedoshim Tiyu. Kedoshim Tiyu means be holy. Kedoshim Tiyu, be holy. Ki Kadosh Ani Hashem, for I Hashem am holy, says Hashem. Hello, Hechem. I, I am Hashem your God, I am also holy. And the question is, what is the connection? between the injunction, the commandment for us to be holy uh, because Hashem is holy. What does that mean? So I want to share a little bit about what this means through the eyes of our Chachamim. This commandment that a Jew has to be holy. You know, Ramban, Nachmanides asks a very interesting question. He asks, what does this mitzvah consist of? You know, there's many mitzvot in the Torah, 613 in fact. Each one of them tells you how to act, how not to act, what to do, how to live. So all of those mitzvot, one would assume, if you did all the mitzvot you became, you were identified as a person who was kadosh, as holy. So what is this separate mitzvah asking you to be holy? if the uh, elements that are required in order to be holy are to fulfill those mitzvot, you already command me to do those. If those are not enough to make you holy, so then what is this mitzvah adding without telling you what it's adding? So what are we being commanded when the Torah tells you, Kedoshim to you, be holy? Rashi says, to you pirushim and arayot. Separate yourself from adulterous relationships. Be a person who lives in a moral way, specifically with relation to relations, okay? Ramban takes it another direction. He says, no, the Torah tells you how to act, how to be. But the Torah, even though it was given uh, in a certain time to a certain people in a certain context, its mitzvot rise above time. So therefore, when the Torah was telling you the mitzvot and talking to an agricultural society, the Torah was also talking to a person who might be invested in Bitcoin, to a person who might be investing in the stock market. And the laws of ma'aser, of how you give 10% of your money, don't apply only to 10% of the wheat in your field. They apply to 10% of your, of your income. So those laws that were given in one scenario, they are adaptable to all other scenarios. Says Ramban, Kedoshim you means look at the Torah and understand how the Torah wanted you to act. Because it, was imp- it would be impossible 
for the Torah to communicate, to talk to every situation and every scenario that a person might ever come across. There will be mitzvot that aren't a direct pasuk in the Torah. And yet, how am I supposed to know how to act specifically in that scenario? Says Ramban, this mitzvah comes to tell you, Kedoshin tihiyu, act as you know the Torah would want you to act. In fact, in Ramban's words, what it means is, go above and beyond. Do the right thing. Be, act the right way. Intuit what the Torah would want you to do, even in scenarios when the pasuk doesn't expre- express or explain exactly what you want. Now, I remember a while ago, I mentioned this recently, in London, there was a, a big brouhaha. A ruckus was raised over all these corporations that had come to London and were not paying taxes. And the people were furious. I think Starbucks was one of them. There were other companies as well that moved to London to take advantage of tax laws there, and they weren't paying taxes. And at the time, they were saying that these people were, uh, they were tax evaders. And I remember that there was a distinction that was put forward in the news uh, and, by, and by the lawyers. And they said it is not the same thing to talk about someone as a tax evader or to have committed tax evasion as opposed to tax avoidance. As an example, you might have a person who does a deal and now this other person owes them money. And you could pay me in this way, way one. If you pay me this way, it triggers uh, a tax obligation. If you pay me this way, it does not trigger a tax obligation. So pay me that way. And that way I don't have, I don't have that obligation to pay taxes. Let's say as an example, I sold you something. And I tell you, you know what? You don't have to pay me in this tax year because you know what? I'm already in a higher tax bracket. I know next year I'm going to do less sales for a variety of reasons. Uh, you, you, I'm going to ask you to pay me. Did the guy, did he evade taxes? No. He avoided taxes. You don't like that I'm avoiding taxes? Change the law. But I'm following what the law says. So how do we feel in this room right now about a guy who's a tax avoider? Halakha, did the right, he's not okay. Right? It's no different than a guy who found a legal parking spot in New York City, even though the city don't want you to park there. But you know what? You don't want me parking here? Write the signs the right way. You know, let the arrows meet each other and not have them six feet across, six feet away. I parked my small car right in between those two arrows. I'm kosher. I'm good. Anyone have a problem with that guy? No problem. But in the Torah, we have a problem with that guy. Because these laws were not given to dodge. They were not given to avoid. They were given to create a type of person. Kedoshim tihiyu. And therefore the point is not to find loopholes in the law, but rather to understand that if this is the law, and this is the concept, and this is the spirit, and this is the logic, then this too would be frowned upon by Bore Olam, would be frowned upon by the Torah. Because as Ramban says, you could have a person who's naval b'shuta Torah. He's an abomination. He's a despicable person. Shuta Torah, but... He's still in the four amot of halakha. He still has the Torah's permission. You have a guy who sits there, eats like a pig all day long, but he made the beracha. Does it say anywhere I can't eat with my hands like an animal shoving food in my mouth? It doesn't say it. I'm not, oh, like, oh, rabbi, come on, rabbi. You're eating like an animal. Right? Does it say anywhere that I can't? No, but it's not right. Everyone knows it's not right, it's not fair, it's not nice, it's not appropriate. But show me the halakha, Rabbi. You know where the halakha is? Over here. Where the Torah tells you to be holy. This is where the halakha is. Don't be a naval b'shuta Torah. You know, I remember there was this, uh, 
I went once to study in yeshiva. Yeah, I parked my car in the parking lot. Comes time, yeshiva is over. I come outside. Someone's blocked, literally full on parked behind my car. Now, I have no problem if the guy wants to park behind my car and sit in his car and study Gemara. No problem. Because anytime I want to leave, I can leave. Finally, 15 minutes now, I'm 15 minutes late, because not only did he learn that day, he also prayed Mincha in, this, in the yeshiva. He comes to his car, I said, how did you, how, why did you park me, how did you block me in like this? The guy says, what do you mean? I figured anyway, you're not leaving Seder. Anyway, you're going to stay to pray Mincha with the yeshiva. You know, it's not my fault. How should I know you wanted to leave early? I said, first of all, I didn't leave early. I left on time. No, there's no law that says that I don't have to pray in yeshiva. In fact, I'm Sephardic. The yeshiva prays Ashkenaz. I'm going to actually pray in the Sephardic minyan. I said, and second of all, what business is it of yours? What if my wife went into labor? What if I have a doctor's appointment? I said, Hazaku Baruch, you spent your whole morning learning and praying, and you're going to get to Shammai, and they're going to send you, not in the up elevator, but in the down elevator, for this morning's activities. Chaval, I said, you should have stayed in bed and watched movies. Anyway, you're going to hell, may as well make use of it. Guy didn't like that one bit. You understand? Naval Bishuta Torah. No, anyway, anyway, he's going to stay. Anyway. How many times does a person do what's called mitzvah habab avera? A mitzvah, a mitzvah that comes with a price tag attached to it, a sin. Double parking is just one of them. Screaming at a guy to go the other way because this is not the way to put the Torah back. So we're going to humiliate the guy publicly for an extra hidur in taking the Torah, why do we go a specific way? Do you know why we go a specific way with the Torah? Out of kavod. Out of kavod for the Torah, we take it to the bima. we take it the long way, and the short way back. To show, right, that we want, we want the Torah with us. Right, that's what we want. That's the that's halakha. But it comes from a kavod of Torah. Every Jewish person, my friends, is a Sefer Torah. How do you humiliate a guy? It's amazing. It boggles my mind all the time. And the people have the best of intentions. But sometimes what I notice is that you have people whose relationship with halakha and their relationship with mitzvot is a checklist relationship. And they're just not aware that those mitzvot were designed for a purpose. They were designed to uplift the human being. Let me share with you a beautiful example from the Dubna Magid. He brings a midrash where the midrash says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to the Jewish people, I want you to be holy, Kikadosh Ani, because I am holy and I am Hashem, your God. He tells the Jewish people, Ho'il v'nikdashtem l'shmi ad shelo barati ha'olam. Since I sanctified you to my name before the world was created, Heyu kedoshim kishem sh'ani kadosh. I want you to be holy like I'm holy. What does that mean? Because you were sanctified to my name before the world existed? What does that mean? Were we sanctified to God's name before the world existed? And what does it mean? Hey, you kiddoshim, be holy. Kishem shan, like I'm kadosh, like I'm holy. Dubna Magid gives an unbelievable mashah. He says, you have a guy, his whole life, he wished he could be a tamir chacham. But unfortunately, he grew up in a family where they didn't have a penny. He didn't have the luxury. So as much as he respected Torah, as much as he loved Torah, he had to work. And by the time he became a businessman, it was very hard. He was already much older when he was successful. It was very hard for him. But he wished, he pined. 
He had one daughter, this guy. One. Him and his wife were unable to have any more children. When his daughter became of marriageable age, he went down to the, to the best yeshiva that he could find in his country. And he asked to have a meeting with the Rosh Yeshiva. He said, Rosh Yeshiva welcomes him in. He says, please, I, all, my whole life I wished I would have had a chance to be a Tamil Chacham. It's the only thing I want for my children. I only have one daughter. Please, he says, don't sketch me. Don't lie. Don't point at the guy you're trying to get rid of. Who's the best guy in this whole yeshiva? And I can tell you from now, hand on my heart, he will never worry for one day in his life. I have enough money to keep him, to let him be a tamir chacham, to let him grow to be a rabbi, a rosh yeshiva, whatever, for the rest of his days. Who's the guy? Rosh yeshiva walks in the bit midrash, points, the guy over there. The guy walks up, he sees, he's studying, he hangs out for an hour, two hours, three hours. Sitting there, studying, uninterrupted. Man says, he walks up to me, he says, listen, the Rosh Shiva has the highest praise for you. I'd love to introduce you to my daughter. Would you meet her? Would you see if it would work? If you, uh, if you, got, if you get married, you have my word, you'll be able to study as much as you want, as long as you want, until you become the gado that you're capable of being. Guy says, fantastic. Sure, they go back to this uh, town where the guy lives. He meets the girl, they hit it off, amazing. Within a short amount of time, they're engaged. A short while after that, married. They're sitting down and learning. How that this guy, he's so happy, he's smiling from ear to ear. A short while goes by and he sees that his uh, new chatan, his new son-in-law, the guy's not sitting and learning. The guy doesn't come to pray in the synagogue. The guy's not there for minyan. One day he calls the guy aside, he says, look, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that overbearing father-in-law. He says, but I, I, can't, I, I picked you because you're Mitsuyan, because you're excellent, because you study, because you're Bachur Yeshiva, budding Tamil Chacham, you know, Yirat Shamaim. what's going on? He says to his father, he says, listen, have you looked around? He says, you looked at the people in this town. People here, bizarre, they learn one hour a month. I'm learning, he says, at least one hour every day. He says, one hour every day? You don't have a job. You were going to be learning all hours every day. Me learning one hour every day. He goes, but look, not one person here. I'm learning 30 times the amount of everybody here. Not only that, he says, you want to know about Minyan? He says, I come to Minyan every Shabbat. Look around the people here. Half the people... Half the people come, one minyan on Shabbat. I'm coming, Arbit, Friday night, Shacharit, and, and uh, Minchan Arbit in the afternoon. I'm here at least three times more than anyone in the town. The guy's looking at this guy, doesn't know whether to laugh or to cry. He says, are you Majnun? He says, I didn't pick the best guy in this town for my daughter. I went to the best yeshiva in the whole country. And I picked you from amongst all the best boys in the country. Your competition is not the people here. Your competition is against the people in the best yeshiva. You were the best of them, not the best of these. It's like when the Jewish people are so proud of the Jewish players that play basketball. We think they're amazing. They're great. They're the best Jewish player. <laughs> this guy is fantastic for the Maccabiah. He's not for the NBA, Michila. I mean, he'll play. Maybe he'll get drafted. Maybe he'll have some minutes. A Michael Jordan, Michael Yarden, we still don't have. <laughs> Look, our hopes are pinned on Ryan Durrell. But who knows, you know, Division Three, Michila. We'd love to see him rise to the top. Bezat Hashem. Hopefully he will. Inshallah. Kiddush Hashem. Fingers uh, magen davided. <laughs> but my friends, you understand? This is Dubna Magid Mashal. God says to the Jewish people, a lot of times you hear speeches about how special Jewish people are. And who are we being compared to? 
the nations of the world who don't have a Torah, you know, we're better than them, that's what we're happy about? That's, that's enough? They have seven mitzvot. If we have eight, we should be pleased with ourselves. God says, I chose you not from a class of the other nations. I handpicked you before the world was created. We're the only two beings in the conversation. Were you and me. And I, I Hashem with my kiddusha, I thought that you were holy. Live up to that. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yisrael Ho'il v'nikdashtem l'shmi Ad she'lo barati ha'olam Since I sanctified you to my name Sof davar Sof, uh, sof ma'aseh Machshava techila I created the world Thinking about the fact that there was going to come a Jewish people That was going to receive my Torah I didn't choose you from amongst the village Of underachievers I chose you before the world existed. We're the only two people, only two beings in the conversation with you and me. And me, the actual arbiter of Kedusha, I saw in you Kedusha. <clears throat> so my friends, the only people we can compare ourselves to is ourselves. Eight mitzvot's not going to cut it. Six, thirteen mitzvot's not going to cut it. We got to do the max to the max. And if God himself says, I believe in you, what does that tell you? You know, there was a, a fellow once, very creative young man. He worked, he worked, he worked, did his best to try and, uh, and succeed. Unfortunately, he had one big idea he put all his eggs in that basket, which apparently you shouldn't do, a person shouldn't do. Put all his eggs in the basket, <clears throat> tried his best, but unfortunately, after two years of working on this unbelievable idea, he still couldn't get the funding, he still couldn't get it off the ground. He'd invested everything in this. He delayed, you know, getting married for this. He, he you know, he didn't see his family, didn't see his friends. And one cold morning, he realizes his dream is over. He's so upset, he goes walking the streets of New York. He sits down on a bench in Central Park, and he's crying. All of a sudden, someone taps him on the shoulder. He looks down, he sees a fella in his bathrobe and slippers. Distinguished looking man. He says to him, is everything okay, son? He figures, why not? This guy's never, never going to see him again. He pours his heart out. I had this idea. This is what I did. This is how I arranged it. I needed this amount of money. I thought I would get it this way. I invested my thing. I sold my apartment. I did. And now here I am. And it's all over. And the guy says, all you need is money? And he takes out a check. And he writes on the check an amount of $500,000 this is a long time ago he says here's all the money you need and more to be able it's a fantastic idea and he looks down at the signature and the signature says Rockefeller the guy can't believe it he says I, I can never he says take your time as long as it takes you need to pay me in a year pay me back in two years no problem I don't need the money guy takes the check, goes back to his office. He's sitting there all morning looking at this check. Until eventually it dawns on him. He says, I told Rockefeller about my idea. And the guy, just on the idea, wrote me the check. He said, this idea is good enough. It will work. I don't need this guy's money. I don't have to come on to this. I, I'm going to make this work myself. And what does he do? He goes to someone, the last person on his list we didn't bother going to, and he brings with him the check of this fellow, and he says, look, I have this check. I don't want to cash it. The guy's going to owe me for the rest of my life. He says, but do you think maybe you could loan me the money? I only need it for a month. I could always bank on this check and pay you back. Please. 
Guy says, you know what? Rockefeller believe no problem. <laughs> he must understand something about the market. I don't. It's like when Warren Buffett invests in something. All of a sudden, everyone wants to invest there. The guy manages to raise the money in a matter of days. At the end of that year, his business is flying. It was a great idea. It just needed the support of the people around him. A year goes by to the day, the anniversary of the day that his life turned around, that his business exploded, that his mood changed, that everything began to fall in place. He takes the check, folds in his pocket. With a big smile on his face, he goes back to the bench to return the money on the anniversary of the date. Anyway, as he's sitting there, waiting, 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 who's walking down? Same guy, with the slippers, with the bathrobe, not a care in the world, looking at the birds, newspaper tucked under his arm. Anyway, um, he starts walking towards this, this elderly man, and two of his aides, they approach him, and they start whisper something in his ear, and they start walking him back, and the man says, hey, 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 wait, 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 wait up. The aide keeps taking him back to his office. There must be something to do in the business. And the other guy hangs back. He says, can I help you? Was everything all right? He says, yes. The only thing, he says, let me tell you, about a year ago, I was sitting here on the bench. I was crying. I had, no, yeah, I had, nothing, you know, I had nothing, in my, uh, nothing to do with my life. Everything was terrible. The world was falling apart. I had no money. I, all I had was this great idea. And exactly a year ago today, um, he, this man that you are walking back to his office, you walk to his house, came to me and he said, you know, he believed in my idea. He wrote me out this check. Unbelievable. My life has turned around. I owe him everything. I just wanted to return the check. I haven't even cashed it. He said, it's a good thing you didn't cash it. I bet you he also told you that he was Rockefeller. <laughs> Whether the story is true or not, I don't know. But it doesn't matter. Even the thought, even though it wasn't true, the thought that someone like that believed in him gave him the uwe to go out, get off his abo, get the money together, figure out how to make it work, and, and launch his business. Could you imagine what it must feel like if you really heard these words? God says, I want you to be holy. You know why? Because I'm holy. And you're mine. And when there was only me and you in the conversation... I picked you and I said that you were my number one draft pick. You were the one that was going to bring Kiddusha to the world. What are you doing with that check? You don't got to cash it. But to walk around with that check. Hashem sees the potential in every Jew even when we don't see it in ourselves. And in fact, there's three different pesukim that the parasha begins with as we start our parasha. The first pasuk says, Kedoshim to you, be holy. Be holy. Go above and beyond. Right? Asita yashar ve'atov. You know, even the mitzvot that doesn't say in the Torah, do those. Be great. I, I am Hashem your God. That means Hashem is the God of the people who keep all the mitzvot, the tzadikim, the ones that are even doing the extra credit. Then it carries on, it says, Ish imo ve'aviv tirao, a person, they should have awe and reverence and kavod for their parents. You know, a person keeps the Shabbat. That's a regular Jew, right? A Jew honors his parents, keeps Shabbat. That's pretty baseline. Hashem is the God of the Benonim, people that keep some mitzvot. And Yashem elokechem ends the second pasuk. And then the third pasuk says, Don't worship idols. Ki Hashem elokechem, I am Hashem your God. The Chidushe Harim says that what God is communicating is I'm not the God of the Tzadikim and I'm not the God of the Benonim. I'm also the God. I'm still your God if you're a Rasha. I'm still in your corner. I still sign your check even if you're worshipping idols. Because you could turn it around. Because I know you. I know you before you knew yourself. This Kidusha inside of you that is unimaginable. So if you're dialing it, dialing it in and you think, you know what? I'm pretty good for the people around me. God's not measuring you by the people around you. 
Sometimes the people around you are in peewee, playing peewee football league. And then you think you're great, you go to the NFL and they actually murder you on the first scrimmage. You're playing in the highest echelons. It is God that sees Kiddusha in you, no matter how far you may have strayed temporarily from your inner, inner greatness. So if you knew that, what would your goals for Kiddusha be? If you saw yourself that way, what would your goals for Talmud Torah be? Maybe, yeah, I go to a class. Every week I go. Maybe you're the guy in the story that tells his father-in-law. Yeah, I learn, I learn, I learn every day an hour. I'm better than most of the people around me. And he's like, that was never the bar- that was never the barometer. Could you learn every day? How much could you learn every day? How deep could you learn every day? Could you try Daf Yomi? Could you try learning Gemara? Could you try understanding maybe Halakha a little bit better? Could you try and elevate your status in your Shmirata Mitzvot? Could you try and maybe, maybe figure out how to have Kavana a little bit more each day in the Berachot until you're a rock star at Kavana and Amida? Could, could, you, could you dial it up? God says, Kedoshim tiyu, ki kadosh ani. The only person in the conversation that you get to compare yourself to, Hashem says, is me. Be'ezat Hashem, we should live up to that incredible potential. Baruch Adonai Le'olam,